what's going on everybody welcome this is whistlekick martial arts radio it is episode 814 and my guest today is yuri lowenthal i'm jeremy lesniak i am your host here i'm the founder of whistlekick and i've been training my whole life i love martial arts i believe martial arts brings out the best version of ourselves and that's why we do all the things that we do we connect educate and entertain traditional martial artists worldwide through this show as well as the other things that we're doing because we're trying to get everybody in the world to train for just six months it's a big goal i've never shied away from big goals so i picked the biggest one i could think of if you want to help us if you want to learn more about what we do and how we're working on this goal go to whistlekick.com check out the links to the books and the events check out our store use the code podcast15 to save 15 percent on something in there like apparel or training equipment a lot of great stuff over there and it changes often the show whistlekickmartialartsradio.com has its own website and it is did i ever say it? it's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com <laughs> sometimes i get in a groove on these things can you tell and what are you going to find over there you're going to find every episode we've ever done because we want you to be entertained we want to connect you with martial artists worldwide and we want to share with you their wisdom on the road to education. If the things that we do resonate for you, please consider supporting us and please continue to support us, whether that's through our Patreon or some other method. If you want to join the Patreon and get bonus content you're not going to find anywhere else, as well as know who's coming up on the show, join the Patreon. Patreon.com slash whistlekick starts at two bucks a month. For two dollars a month, you know who's coming up on the show. Five dollars gets you bonus episodes and it goes up from there. Now, my guest today, I don't even know how to summarize this. I don't want to give things away because there's some cool stuff that we talk about. And I'm afraid that if I summarize most of those parts, you know what? Let's do this. Yuri Lowenthal is somebody who started martial arts as a sort of a family thing. There was some family influence there. And let's say wandered a little bit, tried some things. And twice in his story, we hear about finding the right place. All on the road to doing some really cool stuff that you're going to recognize, if not from experience, at least in name. I'll almost promise you that. But instead of the vagueness, Let's just go. Here's Yuri's episode. <laughs> well, thank you for doing this. I do appreciate it coming certainly, on. Certainly, certainly. And and if you're good, you know, we can just kind of jump in. Let's jump I, in. I like when we just get to jump in. All right, cool. All right. So we're we're here. I know Andrew met you at Rhode Island Comic Con, and mm -hmm. I'm sure you guys have had some conversations. I don't know about really any of them other than we're here now, and, and we kind of do that by design. Yeah. But it is a martial arts show, and I know you have some martial arts background. So let's. Let's press play on the tape. Where Where's the first chapter that picks up with you and martial arts? I would say, I mean, I grew up uh, a, a nerdy kid in the 70s and 80s. And I'm trying to think of exactly when it started. I, I began training, I mean, you know, growing, growing up that kid in the, you know, primarily in the in the 80s there you know we were uh obsessed with uh uh you know ninjas yeah I mean, that was yeah you that weren't was, alone that was, there yeah, was i know there that, was, that was sort of where we were at <laughs> yeah. but my dad had already been studying taekwondo for years he was yeah he was if i if i recall by the time i started training we were here's here's another little curveball uh yeah. we were in west africa um at the time my my dad was uh, worked for usaid and we had uh we had moved to west africa he had already been training in uh in taekwondo and we found a, a teacher there it was the guy who he was a korean guy who uh taught the uh, nigerian police taekwondo and wow. he wanted to he wanted to do he wanted to teach a class for americans as well uh, at the embassy mm -hmm. and my dad was like well i already uh I already studied Taekwondo and there was another guy in the community who did as well. And so they put together this class and that's when I started my training 
So I started uh, training with with my dad as one of the teachers. Oh, that's cool. How, how old are you roughly at that point? I was uh, I was roughly uh, 11, 10, 11 okay. at that time. Okay. And trained the entire time that, that I was there. Mm -hmm. And then when I got back to the States when I was 14, uh, I continued uh, Taekwondo in Northern Virginia with obviously a different instructor, another still a Korean guy. Sure. Uh, uh, but uh, that's where I uh, I continued my my training. Um, I don't know. Do you want to just start with the the beginning parts? Or... Well, it's you know we we can go where you want to go because okay. you know one of the things I've learned over the years is that mm -hmm. the less I steer, the more the guest sure. drives yeah. where they want to take it, and that's gotcha. the stuff that they tend to really you know be passionate about. So you you hit the points in the order you want to go. Okay. Uh, so, so I did, uh, Taekwondo. I never, my, my dad was a black belt, but I never got my black belt. Um, I was just short of it. How long um, were you in West Africa? And that was, I was in West Africa for four years. Okay. And okay. then. So yeah, so just shy. Yeah. And, and I, you know, when I, I, I came back to the States, you know, continue my training and just never, never quite got there. I think in retrospect, I mean, I was a kid in high school and I had a lot going on. Um, and so I wasn't, uh, I wasn't focusing on that, but I, but I also feel that, uh, I, I got bored with that particular style, mm -hmm. not because it was too easy, but just the, the type of form it was, it was very, it felt very rigid to me. Yeah. And it was also during that time that I got into, uh, gymnastics in high school okay. and my two teachers there or my two coaches were these Vietnamese martial artists and gymnasts. And they were, they were super into Kung Fu. They had been you know, training mm -hmm. Kung Fu. And we used, while we didn't do any of that training while we were practicing gymnastics, we knew they could do it and they would occasionally do stuff. And they would take us to the cool theater downtown. Um, that was the only place that showed, you know, Kung Fu movies. I, I, I um, somehow when you said time. growing up as a kid in the 70s and the 80s, I knew we'd get a point where right. we went and saw Saturday morning matinees, I'm guessing, Kung Fu theater, yeah. you know, from like nine to two, right? That yeah. seems to be like what everybody exactly. did. That's that's where I was introduced to Jackie Chan and you know, like yeah. like I mean, you know, all the classics, you know, Shaw Brothers films and um and so I, in, in, you know, in looking at those styles, I was like, ah, oh, that's a much more fluid style. It's, it, it felt somehow more interesting to me. Mm. I didn't start studying that then, but, but I, I fell in love with Kung Fu at that point. Um, ended up, you know, leaving, you know, Taekwondo, just, uh, just, you know, sort of giving up on it. And uh, I mean, my, my, my teacher may have been a little sadistic too i don't know maybe that maybe that led to some of it i have no, no idea but he, uh, he wouldn't have been alone there, there were kind of few yeah 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 especially I'm sure that's not your first story like that no, no um and and then i went to i went to college at william and mary mm -hmm. in uh virginia and, and and had fallen in love with japan at that point mm -hmm. i i started i mean again like all kids in the 80s you know uh, I mean, I grew up watching, you know, Godzilla movies on Sundays and um, I was, you know, fascinated with, you know, Japanese culture. And at that point, anime, even though I didn't really know, know it as much as anime, like the way we do today. Yeah. Um, and, you know, ninja films and samurai and, you know, all the all sort of, the, you know, the cool things that kids right. get into when they when they find out about Japan. And I'd started studying Japanese in my very last semester of high school, they just started this pilot program and I had already studied some other romance languages and I'm like, Oh, well, Japanese sounds really interesting. Mm -hmm. Totally got into that and wanted to continue that in college. So one of the reasons I chose William and Mary was they had a, a burgeoning Japanese program. And so, so I was studying Japanese in college okay. and I knew from previous experience living overseas and so on that, if I didn't get any kind of immersion, I would never mm. truly learn the language. So I looked for ways to, to get to Japan. And the first way I found was a, a junior year abroad program that then took me to Japan, took me to Osaka mm -hmm. in my uh, 
in my junior year. And when I got there, they they have a, a club system at university, a college, because we would we were we were sort of on the campus of uh, Kansai Gaidai University. And uh, I looked at all the clubs and there was, you know, like a rock and roll club and then this club and a that club. And a, um, and they had a Shorinji Kempo club, mm -hmm. a Shaolin Kempo club, which was sort of like a very interesting bridge between taekwondo and and you know sort of more those style arts and yeah. belts and and a much more fluid style and so i started doing that i was like this is probably a good club for me to get into and studied with this and then also as a, as a bonus the guys that i was uh, it was all japanese students for the most mm -hmm. part um those guys and i started a band together while i was there which is ridiculous because <laughs> i'm no kind of musician or singer but because i was this cool american guy um they were like you've got to front our band we play all american music uh anyway and i was like uh, what, what kind awesome. of music were they were they doing was it all over the place or was it well that was that was exactly that was the answer. yeah I, I said i said well what kind of music do you guys play and they're like oh we play hard to rock and i'm like awesome i listen to a lot of i mean what do you what do you guys listen to and they're like uh you know, like uh, uh, Brian Adams and uh, and and I was, I was like, expecting oh. you were going to say like, oh, you know, Starship. Exactly. <laughs> Toto. You're like Toto and Brian Adams. And I'm like, OK, I, we have different definitions of hard rock, but cool. Uh, let's I mean, look, nobody's ever been willing to give me a chance before in a band because I'm no good. Um, so, yeah, let's let's do this. So so we would study during the day and then on weekends we would go and uh, rock out in a band together. Oh, that's I, was, great. I was terrible, but it was but it was fun. So. And they were very supportive, and we played one wedding, I think. But it sounds like um, a, blast. a battle of the bands. But uh, but it was it was super fun, and so I was so I was I was I was doing uh, Shorinji Kempo there, and then I came back to the you know I came back to school after mm -hmm. after my junior year abroad, and then went back to after I graduated I went back to Japan for a couple of years, but didn't continue uh, any martial arts training. I was mm -hmm. doing a lot of. Uh, theater training I was doing Suzuki style theater training which was a very physical style um, and even though when I went back to Japan I went to work for the Japanese government I it was a very bureaucratic job I had I had since you know in in the end of high school and in in college fallen in love with acting and theater and would show up to this with job and do this job that was allowing me to live there in Japan uh but it was, you know, it was an old school Japanese, you know, very bureaucratic government office. And it it was not fulfilling and it was very smoky. It was, you were still allowed to smoke in the office uh, in the, you know, early 90s in, in Japan. And so I would, as, as soon as I would get off work, I would go work with, you know, Japanese theater companies and Australian theater companies and make stupid movies with my friends. And, you know, just I just I found I couldn't let that part of me go. And after a couple of years in this job, I thought, wow, I, I you know, I'm, I'm clearly in love with acting and storytelling mm -hmm. and, you know, making movies. And I got to, I don't want to look back in 30 years, you know, in, a, in a, like a dead end, you know, government job and think, oh, that sounded like it could have been fun. I know the government work will be here if this whole acting thing doesn't work out all you know, I'll, I'll I'll go, I'll try it, and we'll see what happens. Sure. And so I left. I left Japan, came back to the states, uh, visited. I figured I would have to start in either New York or Los Angeles. Visited both. Loved New York, hated Los Angeles. Um, so so moved to New York for the next six years and just did, mm -hmm. you know, experimental theater and black box theater and independent films and sort of whatever I could I could do. Um, and while I was there. I found in in just my last couple of years of those six years, I I found a uh, a kung fu school, a wushu school. I don't know why. I mean, I I I knew in in going to check out the school that I had finally found what I really, you know, my like what I really loved about martial arts. I mean that it it had that fluid quality that I wanted. They were not focusing you know on on sparring the whole time which you know always used to be the case in taekwondo um and and i and the and the teacher uh was a chinese guy 
uh, who's who's a rocket scientist. And literally that was right. Yeah, yeah. He's a rocket scientist, Kung Fu, you know, uh, expert. And he would his his job was rocket science, but he had opened this Kung Fu school. And I mean, he he rarely came in. It was his all his students were teaching the classes. Uh, but the really cool thing about it was that he wasn't into upsells and mm -hmm. selling testing and your next belt thing. And, you know, he wasn't into the money, you know, charging you exorbitant amounts for, you know, your uniform and things like that. He just wanted people to study Kung Fu. Mm -hmm. And so it was really cheap. It was like 75 bucks a month or something like that. And I would go early in the morning before going to my, my day job, I worked at a bank, I worked at Citibank and I would skate a, a rollerblade to it's how I got around in New York. And which in retrospect sounds extremely dangerous and I would never let my son do that. But uh, I would skate to, to Kung Fu at, and do that from 6.30 to 8.30 in the morning. It was like a two hour class. And, and then I would put my work clothes on my sweaty body and, and skate up to uh skate up to my my day job and and I loved it and I did that for like a year and a half or two years almost and then moved to Los Angeles where try as I might I couldn't find a school that had the same vibe mm. uh, there were wushu schools in um more so now I think uh in 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 Los Angeles, it, you know, so, and they were it was like combination usually like stunt wushu and you know things like that, and and I went and sat in on a few classes and they just didn't have that same vibe that I'd fallen in love with, which was just doing it for the love of the art, uh, that that we had in in New York. People have said that about a lot of things in L.A., right? That yeah. it's all you know one degree of separation from uh, acting work, you know, career work, camera yeah, work, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, th I think, you know, that that might very well be the case. I haven't studied all the, you know, or visited all the schools out here. I'm sure there are some good ones. In fact, uh, so the, the the end of that story is I just gave up mm. and didn't study for, you know, 20 years um, while, you know, while living out here. And I, you know, but I always look back fondly on, oh, I had just found what I really loved, you know, in that world, what really you know, got to me. Uh, in the meantime, I had, uh, you know, I've been acting um, and, you know, created a career that's uh, most people know me for uh, my voice acting stuff in video games and animation and so on. But, but I still do know a little bit of everything. And uh, in fact, in one of my jobs was narrating a documentary about the history of Kung Fu films called Films of Fury. Uh, which you can find out there. Uh, like, look it up, Films of Fury. It's a basic primer. Yeah. Like, if you really know kung fu films, you'll be like, yeah, I know all this stuff. Uh, but it's a really cool, you know, sort of sort of quick primer for mostly for people who who aren't familiar. But but it's super fun. When you and, when you picked up that that gig, how long had you been out of training? Oh, years, years and years and years. But did I, you but I pick still, it up because you missed training, or was it just complete coincidence? I think it was. I think it was part coincidence. I mean, the the people who were involved in making it already knew me. Mm -hmm. um, and they're like, hey, you like martial arts films. Hey, you're a voice actor. Um, <laughs> would you would you do this? And um, I, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously I, I missed it, but I also still loved, mm -hmm. you know, the, the like martial arts cinema. And so it was still exciting for me. And so I did that. Uh, and then about seven years ago uh my wife and i had a son and all i could think of as he was growing up was i want to get this kid into martial arts it was good for me as a kid i think it'll definitely be good for him he's really in his body he's got a lot of energy um but i i remember looking at you know, i was like i was like we should probably be great i would love for him you know partially because i thought it'd be great for him and partially you know just as a guy living through you know living you know vicariously through his mm. son <laughs> i wanted him to get into that yeah and so i thought oh well my my homework now is to find find out if there are good you know if there's an if there's a good school now that's opened up in the meantime and luckily and you know i i did you know to to, to whatever credit 
I I did look into some other, not just, I wasn't looking into wushu schools. I, I knew I wanted him to get into martial arts. Ideally, it would have been that, but I looked, I looked at a bunch of different places. And I found a school that was taught, or that is taught, um, Master Hu or Shifu Hu, who's there right now um, and teaching. He does it. He used to be uh, in, you know, Kung Fu films. Like we've, I forget, uh, some some Shaolin film with, with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Jet Li, you can see. Him oh, cool. I mean, he used to he used to be in that. And he came to came to the U.S. and he and his wife started a, a school, and they had like I went in and watched. A, I audited a class with my son when he got you know to be of age. We had I had looked into some places before, and they like oh you know six is the youngest age. We'll we'll take. I'm like oh, he could start earlier than that, and we looked at one place that was it was more culty than than I wanted it to be, mm-hmm. and then. Finally, I found this place and we went and audited the class and I was like, holy cow, this this school feels like the school that I was in love with in New York. It's very bare bones. Um, the Shifu's really good with kids. Um, he's very patient. He's not a taskmaster. Um, he he understands that, that kids learn when they're having fun. Uh, and I was like, this is the place. And so I started my son at this school. And you know, he complains sometimes about having to go to class or whatever, but I can tell that he loves it and he's, he's getting great at it. But I would sit there on the sidelines watching him the entire time thinking, oh man, I wish I was back out there. Mm. And, and then I saw that one or two of the other kids in class, they had parents who would come in and train with them in the kids' class. And I thought, this is perfect. I'm in my 50s now. Um, I've got no business, you know, starting, you know, just hardcore martial arts training. Uh, this is probably the perfect gateway to get back in. And I started training again in the kids class. And I, I tried it. some of the, uh, they have, they had day, they, these are mostly like evening classes because they know that kids have, uh, you know, school and stuff during the day. Uh, but they, they had adult classes in the mornings and I thought I have a weird job. Sometimes I'm free in the morning. Uh, and I, I started those classes and couldn't keep those up just because my my work is so erratic. I couldn't I couldn't be regular with the the adult classes. So so I've gotten back to it uh, in just in working with with the kids class, which is actually perfect for me in my age. I'd I'd already jumped back into it uh, a little too hardcore and uh, hurt myself because in my head I was like, oh, yeah, I just. I just finished my wushu train, you know, it's been 20 years and I was now in my fifties. Uh, you know, oh, I'm sure I can do, you know, exactly what I did before and hurt myself a little bit and had to rest up and come back and, and start a little slower. Um, Cause you know, you get, uh, you get the kid energy going, especially with all these kids around mm. and I'm not, you know, as, as young as I used to be. Uh, but it's been fun getting back to it in a very casual way. And in a way at my age where, where I'm not, you know, when I was younger, I was obsessed with, you know, perfection and and getting better and excelling and getting to the next level and and all of that stuff that you know youth brings. And now I'm like, oh, I show up to class. That's, you know, that's that's like the level at which I'm comfortable and the, you know, level that that suits me right now. And and it's been fun getting getting back into it, especially mm-hmm. at this age and. And kind of you know learning it again and then bringing it back into my life, but yeah, uh, it's just it's just an interesting place to be right now. So many places we can go with the things that you you Take just kind of laid out, yeah. Um, you know that. But I'm gonna I'm gonna play a guess here because okay. you, you talked about Taekwondo and you talked about Japan and and, and Kempo, which I, I've I've always described to people who don't know it is Kung Fu that hung out in Japan for a while, right. Some of the some of the edges got got you know uh, the soft edges got sharpened a little bit, right? And and talking about kung fu and wushu and, and but also gymnastics. Mm-hmm. And so what I'm what I'm wondering is, does it all kind of fall under the same heading for you? Is it all movement? See, some people keep martial arts in a separate box, but I'm wondering if you're not someone like that. Was gymnastics another way of expressing your body in the way wushu was? Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, not to diminish either gymnastics or martial no, arts. No, no, no. But for me, it was 
also like a cool factor mm. uh somehow like i i thought it was all so cool like i thought you know gymnasts were cool um flipping around was cool um you know martial arts was cool uh you know, Jim Cotta for us was a big, you know, at the time, I know it is it is a laughable film, but we loved it because we were on the gymnastics team and we were right. also into martial arts. So right. like it was um I've since watched it uh, in recent years and it is still very good for a laugh. Um but yeah, I think I think it does have to do with with movement. I when I was in Japan, I also studied uh buto dance, which is a very mm -hmm odd uh you know when seen from you know the outside or from the inside too honestly uh a form of dance that is a very uh grotesque uh you know dance form that that grew out of like post-atomic you know japan mm. um and uh is is sort of the anti-ballet it's it's slow and not fluid at all and you know uh ugly and um but I was I'd always been fascinated by it. You, most of the the practitioners uh you know paint you know shave their bodies and you know paint their you know paint themselves entirely white and it's it's very striking to look at. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, I think when you look at the theater that I studied there and the dance that I studied there and uh you know martial arts and so on, I guess I've never really thought about it this way, and uh, which is one of the reasons I was excited to come on the on the show because i've never really looked at my life from a you know martial arts or mm. movement perspective i always talk about it in terms of oh you know acting or you know languages traveling whatever um but it is interesting to see how often i was entranced by movement and, and studied movement in one form or another and yet i don't because i never you know i never became a dancer i never I never, you know, became a professional martial artist. Any of that, I, n I never really look at myself as a movement professional or somebody who's, whose life is steeped in movement. And yet, what you're laying bare right now is, is it looks like that maybe I have been. Yeah, it's, you know, over the years as I, I talk to different people and, and you know, I'm, I'm thinking about an episode that we released yesterday. Of course, this will air a few weeks into the future, but yesterday we released an episode with Rick Worthy. And I don't know if you know him by name. You would certainly recognize him. His IMDb yeah, is exactly. incredibly long, The Magicians yeah. and Supernatural and, and a uh -huh. bunch of other stuff. And one of the things that we we found through our conversation, even though it's been a long time since he's formally and actively trained, because he, like you, started training early because it was such a passionate thing, it became this perspective that he looked at the world with and he looked at his acting, looks at his acting with. And that's kind of, I'm hearing something similar with you that, you know, because what, what's acting if you just stand there, right? It's it's, right. it's kind of boring. Exactly. And and I, I, I suspect it's not an accident that of the images you sent over, you know, the more prominent one is you in a motion capture suit. Right, literally, right. right in the name, motion. Right, right, motion. You're, you're, you're absolutely right, and it, it's been interesting uh, seeing how you know I started in theater, uh, which is very physical, and you know went into you know film and TV, and then found voice acting, mm -hmm. which you don't get to see my body uh, when I'm acting, and yet I'm very physical behind the mic, and I think it's part of what really brings my performance to life is feeling it in my body even though you can't see my body and yeah. even though i don't have a you know freedom of movement you know when i'm when i'm right behind you know the mic here i can't just go all over the place because the mic is what picks up the performance um although i will say you know so much of what i do in video games is you know if you play video games it's it's a it's a lot of you know combat type things yeah. and some actors are very uh uncomfortable at doing making like physical sounds mm -hmm. and yet you know i've been keying you know my entire you know life and so <laughs> like and, and you know when i'm when i'm throwing punches there are sounds and when i'm you know doing those kind of movements there there are sounds and that i think that has really colored my performances but then to find myself you know back to video games coming back to a place where video games employ a lot of motion capture now um and they're looking for actors who are who are good voice actors 
but also who have, you know, movement backgrounds and theater backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And while I do have uh, extremely, you know, talented stunt doubles for games like uh, Marvel Spider-Man, uh, a lot of, the, you know, the, the, the all the acting part is me and then my, you know, my double steps in. Um, yeah. And it's and it's like this, this, this fantastic dance where, you know, a scene might have some acting components and then some action components. And I'll, 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 do the scene up until a certain point and then uh and then my my stunt double steps in and finishes the scene with the with the action and it's uh it's been a very cool uh dance like i said and dance again back to you know again back to right. back to movement right it's we, we can we can call it a dance we can call it a fight we can call it a scene right it's all it's all roughly the same stuff you you know i haven't seen you do voiceover work but i've we, we've all seen plenty of you know b-roll and behind the scenes stuff of people doing voiceover and what do we see the good ones are moving around we see their hands if you see uh people record music right the, the passionate music their their hands are all over the place and they're they're right on the mic because they've got to be right there because they're trying to bring so much of it forward and I, it yeah. sounds like it's all the same stuff so here before we we, we go to some other stuff i, I gotta ask yeah. why gymnastics Right, because you, you come back, you come back from West Africa. So unless you're the only person who's experienced this, I'm imagining you're you're stepping back into a school where um, you know, people are like, Oh, there's the new kid. He used to live in Africa, and probably not always an easy transition. Absolutely. And and then you're joining the gymnastics team, which um uh, maybe maybe it was different where you were, but I'm not familiar of an area of the country where boys' yeah. gymnastics was right. uh, broadly yeah, no, considered popular. No, exactly. We were a football school, like you know, many many schools. I mean, you know, they there were there were a fair amount of sports there, but you know, the sport was like football and baseball, and um, the gymnastics team was was small and underfunded, uh, you know, old old equipment. But the but the people who joined it were really you know hardcore, um, and it and it's funny because we're not funny. I I started when I was a started doing gymnastics when I was a sophomore in high school. Which, if you know anything about gymnastics, most kids start gymnastics when, like, when they're four, yeah, and they do gymnastics their whole lives. And by the time that they're a sophomore in high school, they're super flexible and really good. And and I was just starting, like, I was starting so late to the game um, that that I knew I would, I would probably never be really good at it um, because most people who who you know get really good at it started when they were, right. you know, right after they were born. Um, but but I knew it was something that excited me, and the I think it still went back to, you know, martial arts. You know, I, you know, the cool martial arts films is you know there's a lot of flipping and handspringing, mm -hmm. and uh, and I saw that in you know in gymnastics. I was always fascinated that part in gymnastics. I wanted to be flipping around and cartwheeling around, and uh, there were other things that I had to learn. You know, there are all these other. Uh, 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 I forget what they call them. Um, you know, specialties or whatever. In uh, what's your favorite? What's your best disciplines? Disciplines, not this, but but there's like Events. there's uh, the rings and yeah. parallel bars and uh, you know, floor exercise and uh, event. What's your best event? They always used to ask, and and mine, I, I, tumbling was always what I was into. I learned all the other stuff. I was terrible at vault. Um, I I'm very you know, like bottom heavy. Um, because I grew up doing martial arts and playing soccer and ice hockey. Um, and so, and, and as a matter of fact, uh, my, uh, you obviously can't see it here or hear it. Um, but, uh, like I have strong like thighs mm. and, uh, my dad did too. I think it's partially a genetic thing. We, we, we call them the low end thighs, uh, for my last name. <laughs> um, and cause my dad had the same thighs. I've got these thighs. So, so, you know, we're, we're sort of strong in our, in our lower half and, and I, did a lot of sports that contributed to that. And so getting to uh, gymnastics, it, it behooves you to, to be lighter on the bottom and, you know, really strong on top. So, so I already had sort of that going against me and certain things were much harder. Uh, but I, I, I loved, you know, I loved the, the tumbling aspect. I, and I had already, you know, been in martial arts. So I had, you know, a flexibility component going for me uh, that helped in, you know, balance. Uh, there was a lot of, you know, a lot of my martial arts history and experience came to 
you know, came to bear in my, in my gymnastics as well. Um, and that, and mostly in, you know, in tumbling. So that was, that was my favorite event. Mm. You're, you're, you're almost describing gymnastics as martial arts. I mean, the way you talked about, about tumbling and kind of bringing forward what you, what you saw in the, in the movies. Yeah. yeah. So it's. Yeah. And I guess it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was closer to the type of martial arts that it's funny. I, you know, left Taekwondo and went to gymnastics in an effort probably to get closer to the types of martial arts that, that I thought were yeah. cool. You know, the stuff yeah. that I saw in movies, you know, the Kung Fu and um, that, that type of thing. It was, it was sort of the closest I could get to that. And even though I was starting late, it was fun. And which you know ended up being great because it turned out those those first two coaches Ty and, and, and that's what I that's yeah. kind of why I wanted to go into the gymnastics subject. I wanted to talk about that. Did you know that they had martial arts experience when you joined gymnastics? Not not when I joined the, I joined the team luck to, to do martial arts. It was it was it was total luck. Yeah. Wow. And did they know about your taekwondo background? And did you have conversations? You remember you anything know, about that? I don't remember, but it must have come up. Yeah. yeah. But they were, they were amazing. You know, like, you know, occasionally you'll meet somebody and and you won't know that they're martial arts. Then they pull something and you're like, oh wow, wow, you're really, like these two guys were magic and they were they were really light and lithe, and and would would pull stuff out. Like I remember once, one of the coolest things I saw uh, when I was doing gymnastics and they were they were coaching. Uh, there's a, you know, a high bar where, you know, people swing, you know, what they call giants around a, a high bar. And then you would release from, from the high bar and, you know, you do your dismount, you know, your flips and land. Um, he, uh, Ty was showing us something once and he released late. And so, so, so instead of going out and he released over the bar and was doing his dismount and his air sense was really good. And he ended up doing his flip and then landing on top of the bar, which I've never seen anybody do before. Um, and still in my head is is one of the most amazing things I've yeah, seen somebody I, do physically. I've never seen anything like that. Yeah, and and balanced on like I mean, like he was like a cat. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Those 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 guys were, were the coolest. And I, you know, there there's sometimes I think back on them and I'm like, man, I wonder where they are. I wish mm -hmm. I had kept up with them. You know, we kept up with them for a few years because they they only uh coached I think the gymnastics team for the first couple of years that that I was on it, and then they left to go do other stuff, and we got a more you know sort of classic gymnastics uh, coach who uh, who had actually um, graduated from William and Mary, where I ended up going. Uh -huh. um, so when I went and started doing gymnastics at, at William and Mary, which didn't last long, I did I did varsity gymnastics for for maybe two years, and and I, and I realized I think at that point it caught up to me that. I had started late and I was not as good as the rest of the team. And while they were very, you know, welcoming and very supportive, I was more interested at that point in studying Japanese and doing theater. And so I was spending most of my time in the theater anyway. When, I, I think the one piece that we don't really have yet is when you thought about acting as a career. It, it seems like the the interest grew, but I mean, let's face it, most people who get into acting never make it a career. Yeah, true. And and I never and for the, for for a while I didn't think it never even seemed like an option. I mean, I certainly didn't grow up in a family of artists or 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 actors or, or nor did I know anybody like that uh growing up. Um I just assumed that I would go into uh international relations in some form or another like my dad. And 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 something ha like in my last year of high school I had always sort of wanted to try acting. I mean, I always loved, you know, I loved movies mm. and I, you know, I loved storytelling. I loved radio shows and just, you know, just, you know, to, as, as an appreciator of that sort of thing. And, and I, I found writing too. I loved, I loved writing. So, so I, I fell in love with, with storytelling in one form or another. I was writing short stories and uh, things like that and plays and, but, I had never really thought I'd, I'd always wanted to try acting, but I was always so busy doing gymnastics or martial arts or playing Dungeons and Dragons or, you know, collecting comics or, you know, like all the stuff that I was, I was into at the time yeah. that I never committed to trying it. 
And I think in my last year of high school, I realized that if I didn't try it then, I would go off to college and I would be sort of, you know, not fully formed, but I, you know, I, I probably wouldn't try it if I didn't try it then in, in high school. So in my last year of high school, I tried out for, for a play and got into a, a drama class and fell in love with it mm. that year. And when I was looking for a college, also looked for a college that, you know, the things that I was looking for in a college was a uh, Japanese theater program and, uh, and gymnastics, which was sort of all the things that I had, I was interested in right then. And William and Mary had all of those things. And I ended up going there much to my father's chagrin. I, you know, he was, he was a, his alma mater was Williams and, uh, and I'd gotten in there and I ended up not going to his alma mater, but <laughs> in retrospect, because he was the one paying for college, uh, you know, going to William and Mary was, was like a state school. There was a, you know, we had a really, really good tuition break. And in the end, he would, I think he was happy that it ended up being far cheaper uh, for me to go to William and Mary. But, uh, I, you know, I, even when I was in college and doing theater and in love with acting, it didn't seem like a, like a, like it could ever be a reality. It, you know, that, that seemed like, you know, something that other people did, you know, like that, that was never going to happen for me and I could enjoy it, but I would go into international relations like my dad and I, I didn't, I didn't, you know, get a theater degree, although I had almost enough credits to, to double major just because I was spending so much time in the theater and taking so many classes. Uh, I, I majored in East Asian studies because I was studying Japanese at the time and it seemed the right course. And then, you know, right out of college, started working for the, for the Japanese government, the local government office in Japan. And so I was, I was basically on track to to be doing that kind of work mm -hmm. and, and could have, I was, I was enjoying myself. I was loving being in Japan, but that I had already gotten the, the itch, you know, I'd already, I'd already gotten hooked and, you know, back to, you know, we're sort of where we started the conversation. That was where I, you know, I had to come back and, uh, and, and try it and see how, how it worked out. Mm -hmm. And, and when... thankfully it did. I mean, it did, it didn't work out right away. I, Although I will say one of the things I, I believe you have to have to succeed in this business, not that I know what it takes to succeed. Everybody has a completely different path. Um, you have to love it. Mm -hmm. And because you're not going to get paid most of the time, and definitely not when you're first starting out. Um, and there has to be something that's driving you. And, and I loved it. And, you know, the six years that I was in New York, just, you know, acting in black box theaters for you know more, less people in the audience than were on stage most of the time uh was that i just i i loved it and and that carried me through to a point where you know, i finally moved out to los angeles with my wife and we were looking for other ways to earn a living as actors besides tv and film she's also an actor okay she's also an actor yeah uh we came out together got married along the way actually and we eloped in in Vegas from on the way out from New York to Los Angeles, <laughs> and uh, 21, 21 years uh, we just celebrated. Congratulations! But uh, thank you. But uh, uh, you know we were looking for other ways to to earn a living out here besides TV and film, which is very hard to you know break into. And even when you're well known for it, the jobs sometimes are few and far in between. And we needed to earn a living, and we were looking for something besides waiting tables and working an office job. And uh, she said, well, what about voice acting? And I was like, wow, I wish I had thought of that first. I'm, you know, I'm the resident nerd in this family. Like I grew up watching cartoons, playing video games. Why didn't I think of that? And it was, again, it was this, the belief that that job, you know, wasn't somehow an option for me. It was like, you know, I didn't know anything about voice acting. I'd studied acting, but not voice acting. There were no voice acting classes at the time when I was mm. studying. And you just sort of, you look at that sort of world from the outside and you're like, oh, well, there are like five people who do that, who do all the jobs, you know, there's like Mel Blanc and, you know, Kevin Conroy, whoever. And um, Morgan Freeman. And Morgan Freeman, exactly. <laughs> Depending on what you want to do, there are like <laughs> five people who do that. And uh, good luck, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I knew how to audition for TV and film and theater, but I, I had no idea. And so we took a class and, you know, like, like I mean, that's that's always the best place to start. You know, take take a class and and the 
the teacher for that class uh, got a job directing a Japanese anime dub mm. and you know, dubbing it into English. And he started auditioning his students. And I got a job doing that. And that, and, and possibly the fact that I spoke Japanese, you know, at that point, um, was, it felt like a, you know, a good fit. And, uh, and it was something that, and I'd grown up watching, you know, anime and cartoons and it was like, this is a good fit. And, uh, once I got into sort of that side of it, uh, it, it, it was an entree into, you know, other parts of the mm -hmm. business and, uh, you know, 20, 21 years later, and here we are. So when we talk about a role like, like, like acting in a video game, you brought up Spider Man. Yeah, it kind of feels like all the pieces, and it feel it's it's really interesting because you know you're you're if we go back, you know I can't imagine that you at you know Kung Fu Theater on Saturday morning weren't sitting there as the rest of us did saying I want to do that I want to be that I want to embody that and that's you know, for, for the audience, they may not realize that the video game industry is actually larger than the movie industry at this point. I suspect you know that, that by, just by raw dollars, more sure. dollars are spent on video games. And I, I believe it's, a, it's part of that, right? There's, you know, the, the time, right? Replay value and things like that. But I think it's also, it's easier to see yourself as part of the story. So here we have you playing a character solely so other people can be that character and it just kind of it's interesting to me because it kind of stacks up all these things that you know your your skill sets but also these things that you've spoken so passionately about today yeah yeah it's it's, it's funny to look at it uh from that perspective but uh yeah you're right do you have anything coming up you can talk about um the the new spider-man game is coming out this year i know okay. people who who were fans of the first game they've been they've been waiting for it for a while and uh, they won't have to wait much longer uh, it's coming out this fall uh i can't say much more than that because <laughs> they don't want me to sure sure um there's a uh, a game uh coming out in just a just a, a few weeks from now so probably right about the time Mm. Uh, according to you that this might be airing uh, called Redfall which is a uh, um, get your friends together and fight vampires kind of game uh, which has been uh, has been really fun as well uh, my wife and I are always still uh, you know working on uh, putting together our own projects as we do in our spare time although cool. since we had a, a child it's uh, the, the time for that sort of thing has been uh, has been less uh, but uh, we're still you know writing and, and trying to create projects as well nice uh, and yeah, I mean, we're just still, still, still doing it. Still, you know, uh, living the dream as best we can. And and now studying wushu again. Which yeah. Is, uh, so it, which, let's. Which has been fun, and and to be there with my son. I mean, my dad is. You know, when I look back, my dad was always the assistant coach. Like when we were doing hockey, he was always on the ice. You know, as the assistant coach. When we were doing, when I was playing baseball or soccer. Like he was always one of the assistant coaches. And it's while I'm not you know, any kind of, uh, uh, coach in, uh, in Wushu being there, you know, on the floor with him has been, has been, uh, you know, really cool and a really cool connection that, uh, that we share now. What was it like shaking the rust off that first class? Oh, terrible. Oh, that's the worst. <laughs> How, how'd you <laughs> feel the next day? Do you remember? Cause, yeah. Cause, cause 20 years, you know, feels like, you know, when you're, when you're, you know, when you're a, you know, a guy in your, in your fifties, who still, you know, plays, you know, 15 year old characters or, you know, gets to be Spider-Man, you know, in, in his fifties, um, you still think there's a part of you still thinks that you're that age. Right. And, um, and uh, so, so, you know, hitting that reality uh, has been, has been tough. And, and again, like I had, I had to realize I got I got to slow way down because I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not the, I'm not the, the, the guy that I was, or I don't have the body that I did, you know, 50 years ago or sorry, 20 years ago. Um, but it's been an interesting adjustment uh sometimes painful uh sometimes painful on the you know on the body and sometimes just painful on the psyche but uh but it's been it's been cool it's been really cool it's great and, and is he still digging it seem like this could be something yeah, that you, you know, spend some time with because he just wants to you know come home and play at home with us and i have to drag him to class i mean you know i was i was i was the same way but but he's, he's still most doing kids it. are but on the ride home he's yeah probably pretty yeah, jazzed exactly exactly and 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 even you know when he's there you know, he loves 
doing it like he gets mm -hmm. into it. it's just it's just dragging him there sometimes but you know he's six so um i get it nice. uh yeah no it's uh it's fun i mean you know i complain about having to drive all the way to i was hoping we would have found a school that was much easier to get to but uh um you know it takes you know it's, it's los angeles you gotta you gotta drive everywhere um, but it's worth it i mean it's it's a great school and uh the the vibe there is great and the shifu is awesome good good i'm glad you found it again yeah does does that jumping back in does that change anything with the the gigs or the roles you're looking for or uh maybe the projects that you're working on for yourself is it does opening that martial arts door again make you think differently about work i mean i always you know sort of getting back into something or learning something new because i almost look at it as you know this at this stage you know 20 years later and you know being my age i i i almost look at it as learning something new again mm -hmm. starting over again and i think it's it's helpful at this age to find things i just like i just started learning to try to you know play guitar i had tried you know a misfire several years ago and um not misfire but i you know tried to give up very quickly um i'm trying to learn new things at this age mm. it, it feels it feels important somehow to to do things that i'm not good at um and try to learn to to get better to you know to stay focused and stay sharp that then sort of you know leaches out into the rest of you know my my life and you know everything i'm doing to to lend uh you know something something new mm. to, to that so so getting back to it uh, has has you know given me that that energy I think you know in in other things as well. Uh, I'll always try to work you know martial arts in one way or another into my uh, into into my projects where I can. We did a a short film several years back and um, there was there was a scene there was a fight scene in it that we uh, we uh, choreographed and um, I was I was again I was disappointed and how many years had gone by since I had trained. I was like, Oh wow. I thought this would look really cool. Um, but, but it always finds it's, you know, finds its way in. Um, but you know, one of my, but you know, I, I try to, I try to do a little bit of, of everything. You know, one, one of my sort of idols from Hong Kong cinema uh, is Chow Yun Fat. Mm. And, and he is like the consummate, like I, I've always idolized him because, or looked at him as, as a, as a, as a model because like he can do everything. Like he's he's sure, great. Sure, he's an action star, but he's also really good at slapstick comedy, yeah. and he's also really good as a you know romantic lead, and he's also really good as the villain. Like I mean, he can he can do anything. And, and, and he is well known as he is. I think he's still dramatically underrated. Uh, oh, a one hundred percent. Um, and I uh, years ago, I you know that's that's what I should uh, I should see. I'll send you the uh, remind me send me an email, Jeremy. Okay. And uh, I will send you, I just uncovered a photo of me and Michelle Yeoh uh, when I was uh, in New York uh, in the 90s. I was, I would help out with these uh, uh, film retrospectives. There was a, a company that would bring it, that would do Hong Kong film retrospectives. And I would uh, offer my services uh, mm. to, you know, help out in any way. A, so I could, you know, you know, meet Hong Kong film stars and so I could go to the movies for free. Um, you know, I just, I just wanted to be there. Um, but, uh, the, yeah, that one day they asked me if, if I would, uh, escort basically be the bodyguards for Jet Li and Michelle Yeoh. And I, to this day, I think that's hilarious that they would have asked me to, or anyone really to do something like that. Yeah. Uh, but on one of those, uh, in one of those, uh, retrospectives, it was a, it was a Chow Yun Fat re retrospective and they, he was doing a signing, an autograph signing after one of the screenings. And, I got in line to to get his autograph and there were you know every it was it was at a time when he was really you know popular yeah. among a you know very sort of culty set of you know film people and you know Quentin Tarantino was, was sort of bringing him to the forefront and you know people yeah. were learning more about Hong Kong cinema um so the so line was actually pretty long uh and it was New York uh, a lot of film nerds in New York uh and I the the I I got up to to him and they cut off the line right behind me so I was the last guy uh, and there were still a lot of unhappy you know people behind yeah. me um, so I was the last guy to get up to him and I had I had I had planned out sort of my my plan of attack 
and and I was I, I and I went up to him and I said, uh, "Hey, Mr. Chow, I'm sure your hand is very tired uh, from signing all these autographs, and you've been here a long time. So um, uh, instead, I would like to give you my autograph." And I gave him a headshot um, of you know the acting headshot that I was using that I had signed. And he looked down at it. He got, was you know, momentarily very confused. He looked down at it. He looked up to me and he said, "He said you're an actor." And and I said, "I said uh, yes. I'm, I'm, that's that's what I'm studying to be right now." And and he stood up, and he took his his hand in in both. You know, he shook my hand with with both of his hands, you know, like this. Mm -hmm. And he said, "I look forward to working with you someday." And I'm you know I'm sure it was just you know polite lip service. Um, and I, I know, you know, I, I now I'm in a position sometimes where I'm at conventions and I'm signing autographs and, you know, a lot of, you know, people who, you know, want to act come up and, you know, and, and but I, I will always, I always try to connect with those people because I understand what those words meant to me that day. He may not, it may have been a passing thing, a passing politeness for him, but for me, you know, on, you know, dark nights of the soul when I didn't know what I'd gotten myself into with acting. I had that as a, as a, you know, just something to, 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 to hold on to. It was, you know, like a, a rock and, you know, in a stormy sea, it was like, Chow Yun Fat said that he wanted to work with me someday, or, you know, I, I should at least, you know, keep going so that one day I get an opportunity to do that. Um, and, and then it meant so much to me that, that then, you know, when I'm, when I'm interacting with, with fans at, at conventions and so on, I really try to be, you know, I'm very present, no matter how tired I am, no matter how many people come before, I try to be very present because I will always remember what those words meant to, and still continue to mean to mm -hmm. me to this day. Mm -hmm. What a great story. That's yeah. that's powerful. Yeah, I made a note. I'll, I'll let you know. Excellent. Good. I'll Look send that, that picture. I, I wish I had a picture of me and Chai Fat, but, um, but uh, yeah, there's, there's a picture of me and uh, standing with Michelle Yeoh, um, who mm -hmm. is as sweet as can be, and, and nobody deserves the success like, like, oh. she, like he, actually her and Kehui Kwan also talk about uh, persistence I mean, with her I mean finally after she's been doing it for how long she's being broadly recognized I mean so many of us have recognized her for a very long time and said you're killing it but now the whole world saying oh okay I guess you're actually pretty good at what you do exactly yeah that that that, that film punched through you know figuratively and literally and yeah. uh, became what it did is it's just I love it I love it how can people find you you want you on social media uh, yes, I'm on social media. Uh, who knows what uh, the future holds for Twitter, but it's it's where I interact most, you know, sure. with with people. Um, I'm at Yuri Lowenthal on Twitter. I'm also at Yuri Lowenthal on Instagram, uh, although I'm old and find myself, you know, interacting less on there. Um, but yeah, no, you can you can you can find me. You can you know, I'm I'm easily stalked online. <laughs> awesome. Well, I appreciate being here today, and this is where. I kind of throw it back to you one more time. How do you want to leave this for the audience? What words? I just, I guess just to, just to say uh, that you never know how, I mean, getting into martial arts, you never know how it will impact your life. There's the way that you think it will, uh, which is, you know, when, when that, that one night when you're getting mugged in the alley, you're going to kick that person's ass and you're going to, you know, feel, you know, like a badass. Um, but I think you should leave yourself open to the ways in which it will affect your life that you won't even see coming um and that you will that will constantly surprise you and sometimes you won't even realize until you're on a podcast about martial arts because <laughs> there's a lot there's a lot more than just kicking ass i want to thank you for sticking around did you enjoy that episode with yuri lowenthal i sure did I had a great time talking to him Growing up, Spider-Man was my favorite superhero, and the idea that I just talked to someone who got to be Spider-Man multiple times, that is one of the coolest things in the world. In fact, if I could go back and tell my five-year-old self, someday you're going to talk to the guy who became Spider-Man, I, I, I don't think I would know what to do. I think I'd probably start crying or something. How cool. Yuri, thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing everything, for being so open. I appreciated our conversation. Audience, go check out his IMDb or any of the other stuff we've got linked in the show notes, his social media, et cetera. If you want to support our continued work here to bring you great guests, please consider supporting us. Join the Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick. 
as well as any of the other many, many things that you can do to help us out. Check out the family page if you're looking for ideas. Two more. You want to have me out for a seminar? Let's do it. I've got a unique method of teaching that applies to everything. And I don't teach you how to kick. I teach you how to learn how to kick and how to practice kicking as an example. And it's been quite successful. People love it. I generally get invited back for seminars at a pretty high rate. So I'm doing something right. The other thing you might consider is we have a team here that we use to help martial arts schools grow. I lead the team, as you might expect, and whether success to you is growth in numbers or growth in dollars or something else, we can help you with it. We're not going to tell you, you have to do it this way. We're going to work with you to identify what is important to you and help you get better at that and grow in the way that is successful to you. If you want to talk to me about that or the seminar thing or anything else, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I look forward to your feedback. Our social media is at Whistlekick everywhere you might think of. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.